The number one reason why a relationship will either work or a relationship won't work is if I keep answering my spouse's primal question with a no or a maybe, that relationship, that marriage will not work. But if I get really good at answering my spouse's primal question with a yes and affirming that as often as I can, that relationship is going to thrive. And that's true for marriage. That's true for friendship. That's true for work relationships. All of it. Hey, everybody. Welcome. My name is Tim Timmons. I'll say it again. Bienvenidos. Welcome to the 10,000 Minute Podcast. And right now you're dying to ask this question. What's 10,000 minutes? Thanks for asking. Uh, There are 10,080 minutes in a week, and generally most of us, uh, some of us, gather as the church for 80 minutes a week, which is awesome. But there are 10,000 other minutes until we gather again. It's not how do we like work for God in the 10,000 minutes. Like, what do we do for God? But it's how do we walk with him and love people really well. And ultimately, it's us putting Jesus's words into practice all week for the flourishing of the whole group. So this season, we are season three we are diving into relationships. So we did a survey with about 1,500 of us wrote in saying, here are some of the areas that it's hard for us to actually follow the ways and heart of Jesus. And the first one was in relationships. So we thought, why not dive into relationships? So we'll get into marriage, parenting, dating, and sex stuff. And I mean, that that didn't sound great, but you know what? Take that how you want to. I meant intimacy. You get it. You get it. Okay. So this is part one of a two episode conversation with my good friend, Mike Foster. Mike has put in several thousand hours of research into what encourages each one of us to thrive or to scramble. What if we can figure out our primal need or primal question and learn how to answer it? So that's what these next two podcasts are about. You guys, this is such important work for us to be doing. I've known Mike for, gosh, 20 years, maybe. And people call him the Mr. Rogers of personal development. I mean, put that on your resume. I guess he did. That's kind of the point. Mike is a best-selling author, executive coach, and host of the podcast Fun Therapy. Uh, His newest book, The Seven Primal Questions, is out now. So his concept is there are seven primal questions that everybody has. Everybody's asking at least one of these questions. And so I went in saying, Mike, I just took the seven primal questions test. Would you just figure out my life. So if nothing else, you guys, you might think this is totally boring, but it was really profound for me and actually really helpful. And I'm, I think by the end of this, you'll want to go take it and figure out what is your primal question and what are the primal questions of your friends and close people around you? So, okay. So this is a really fun podcast. I love Mike so much on so many levels, but maybe go to primalquestion.com. Just a singular primal question dot com and take the test. I mean, it's super quick and it might even be helpful for you to go through this podcast knowing what your primal question is. And I don't know, I think this will be helpful for your life and for everybody around you, because the hope is that as we become more beautiful and aware and as we practice the ways of Jesus, it's better for the whole group, the whole world, our neighbors, everyone. Okay, so uh, here we go. Thanks, you guys. Oh, and thank you for those of you who are supporting 10,000 Minutes financially. This thing happens because of you. It's kind of our own Patreon type thing. We're not on Patreon. You just go to 10,000minutes.com, and then there's a way to partner in the upper right-hand corner. So thank you for that. Also, if this is encouraging for you or for other people, would you like and maybe rate it or share it with somebody else? All that good stuff matters. Okay, now it's finally time for our podcast with Mike Foster on the 10,000 Minutes Podcast. Uh, well, welcome to the 10,000 Minute Podcast, Michael Foster. What is 10,000 minutes total? You know, it's, what do you mean? Like, like, how many, it's yeah, 10,000 like, minutes. Yeah, I, well, I know it's 10,000 minutes. But Did you like, see the, the, the Nate Bregazzi, his uh his SNL skit? No, I didn't. Oh. I love him, by the way. You have to watch it. Okay. It's about, he's George Washington. And he says, what I want to bring into this beautiful nation is like, it's a, um, a way of telling uh, space and meters. Like he's talking about like, uh, he says, what I want to bring is I want to bring this new form of, you know, <laughs> yards and feet yeah. 
inches. And inches. Yes. And I want a thing. I want a ruler where on one side it's centimeters <laughs> and the other side it's inches and they will never match up. It's so good. Oh, that's what so did good. I just say that? Well, because we're talking about at like 10,000. Yeah. 10,000 minutes. minutes. Is, what is 10,000 minutes? Yeah. Is that like five years? Is it a month? Like, what is it? Yeah. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Um, 10,000 minutes. There are 10,080 minutes in a week. Okay. Feel pretty good about yourself. Okay, I am. So it's a week. It's a week. It's a week long. Yeah. So 80 of those minutes are spent in some church gathering. If you do that type of thing, which is great, okay. but there are 10,000 other minutes. Uh, and it's not, what do we do for God in the 10,000 minutes? It's just, how do we join in what he's already doing Yes, and practice his ways with each other in the 10,000 minutes? I like that. Like the example I always use is somebody cuts me off and I've always had things to say or to look at them. I actually tell people, I smile when I look at you. If you cut me off, I will smile like a good Christian boy, but I'm thinking in my heart that I'm better than you, mm. which is contempt. Mm-hmm. And so- I started going, gosh, I'm such a great American Christian, but <laughs> put me outside of the 80 minute gathering. And that's when I want to actually start joining Jesus as there. So, yes. Hence the 10,000 minutes. Okay. I'm glad to be here now. So welcome to I've, that. I, I, podcast. I was always glad to be here. Yeah. But now that I know the whole backstory of 10,000 minutes, yeah. I'm really glad to be here. Well, I mean, a lot of it started, Mike. When, so I mean, how many years have we been friends? So that's got to be uh, close to 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, so we met at Mariner's Church mm-hmm. through a guy named Stan Endicott, yes. who is both of our heroes. Absolutely. Um, we have a lot of dirt on that guy. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things we could talk about. <laughs> the whole podcast. He is the hero of heroes. Anyway, so we met through Stan, and we were both just creatives trying to figure life out, and you were just always this really bright light, <laughs> like bright as in smart and just a genius. Like mm. You've always been a consultant, probably even since you were a little dude just the way that you see the world and see people and things. It's just so fresh and it never feels contrived or normal. Mm. And I love that about you. You you just have always had a weird, different way of looking at the world and always respect that and love that. So thanks, um, Mike, what I love is I was looking at your bio and it said, it said that you're known as the Mr. Rogers of personal development. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I love Mr. Rogers. Me too. Huge. It's sort of uh, Jesus, Mr. Rogers, yeah. and Jim Henson for me. So, well, you're looking great. Um, and the other thing that I loved here it says Mike is a certified experiential specialist. Yeah. It says recognized by the International Society for Experiment Exper- Experiential Experiential Professionals. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, is that? Tell me a little bit about this this institute. Yeah. Well, it just means that I you know a lot of my stuff. a lot of my training around therapy and counseling and coaching yeah. is focused much more on experiential modalities versus like talk therapy. Mm. And so I I'm explain, a, explain that. Well, I'm a big believer in the, especially when we're dealing with trauma or things that are long in our history, family of origin wounds, things of that nature, that if we can get people up and moving and role playing and getting out of our big brain and getting back to kind of our more primal parts of our brain, yeah, that's going to help us actually get to the breakthrough and the clarity that we want and really release the the trauma that we've been holding for, for decades. And so that tends to be where I focus. And experience could be all the way from role playing to drawing and doodling to cathartic experiences like yeah. you know, breaking plates that represent shame or uh-huh. it's that kind of approach to uh, our, our development versus, Hey, let's just sit down. You sit on the couch and let's talk. Mm. And there's certainly value in talking, right? But there is a limit, uh, especially with trauma with just doing it through talk therapy. And so mm. that's just kind of where my focus is. I, I love that. I love that. So you, you've got a podcast. Are you still doing fun therapy? I, I'm actually getting ready to fire it back up. I, yeah. I took a break for a couple of years, mostly just due to COVID and writing the book that yeah. I've been working on. Yep. But that was a great pleasure doing that. So Amoy, who is one of my co-hosts and she works for 10,000 Minutes and she's just the coolest human. We were talking about people to get, you know, to interview. And she said, have you ever heard of this guy named Mike Foster? And I'm like, who? (laughs) No. (laughs) Guy sounds like an idiot is what I said. (laughs) 
it was just so fun for her because she loves fun therapy, mm-hmm. has loved your books. Yeah, just that made me so happy. It's amazing how a podcast and just talking about things that, you know, people are experiencing in their life, because that's all we, the podcast is about is just, hey, let's let's talk about a challenge. Let's talk about yeah. a struggle. Let's talk about something you're working through and yeah. just to have people share openly and vulnerably. It really certainly resonated with people. And so it's, yeah. it's a pleasure to do it. And I'm really excited about firing it back up. Let's go fun therapy. So people check out fun therapy. Um, okay. Mike, you wrote a new book um, that is called the seven primal questions. Thank you. And what are the seven primal questions? We're just going to dive into that a little bit. And then I took the test myself, which yes. I'm going to have to have everybody else take this test. Then we're going to dive into me and you're going to, we're going to have some fun therapy there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, totally. Well, maybe to start off, I, I'd share like a story yeah. to kind of represent what No, I'd is. rather you just give the exact details. <laughs> yeah, let's um, just go Take right us to the throne to, room. Here we go. Um, but it's a story. It's not an original story, but it's a story by David Foster Wallace, who's an author and essayist. And he, I think he was giving a commencement speech at a college, and he shared this parable about these two fish that, we're uh, swimming along and the fish are stopped by an elder fish and the elder fish goes, Hey guys, how's the water? And then the two fish kind of swim along for a minute or two and they then look at each other and they go, what the heck is water? And the point of the story is that so often in our lives, we're just, we're in something like we're swimming around and it is so vast and mm. so known mm. and so like close and yet all around us that sometimes we just miss the water. Yeah. We don't have, we, you know, just as fish could be living their whole lives, but never recognize the fact that they're in water. And so the primal question in this whole concept is about the water, something that you and I have been swimming in for mm. our entire lives uh-huh. and have probably have missed it. And have never seen its full influence, not only in the negative ways where it's like if I were to take fish out of water, they would die in the same way. If I were to take your water away from your life, you would die. But also the gift that comes from having being in water. So mm-hmm. this really this whole research and the whole book is about understanding kind of our core drivers and really the corest of driver being our apex emotional need. And so these seven questions really just represent the highest emotional need that you have as a person. Mm. And every one of us has one need that drives everything. It'd be the water. Okay. Uh, okay. And so our one need is the water. Yeah. When you're yeah. in the water and you're having that need met, you're fantastic. Uh, you're your best self. Yeah. But when you're not getting that water, you go into what I call the scramble. And the scramble is all the unhealthy and dysfunctional things that we do to try to get the water back. Okay. okay. And so I've been working on it for about five years, 6,000 uh. hours of one-on-one interviews, uh, 22 group labs, a lot of research on. How long is 6,000 hours? Gosh. <laughs> five years, uh, it, five years. Yeah, really. It's a long time. <laughs> it was a lot of conversations to really develop a concept that I hope is really profound, but also simple and easy to use. And so the seven questions, it comes down to seven questions. And basically here's how the formula works. In early childhood, we are imprinted with a primal question. Mm. Okay. A question that we, we asked our caretakers that either went unanswered or was uh, maybe answered with a no. And we then get imprinted with that question and we keep answering, asking it subconsciously into our adult lives. And so when that question, that primal question is answered with a yes, we feel good. We've got water. Yep. Yep. But when it's answered with a no or a maybe, we then go into the scramble and do everything we can to get, force the answer back to a yes. Hmm. Hmm. So I'll give you an example. Question number one is uh, the primal question, am I safe? That's actually my primal question. Okay. And my primal question comes from my early childhood imprint of sexual abuse. So I had a family friend, I write about this in the book, a family friend 
that I would go spend the night with my parents, you know, whatever Yeah, back in the day. Yeah. And this person would, would sexually abuse me while I was over there. And then after about a year of this, I finally get the courage to tell my parents and we never really talked about it again after, after mm. them. now this is not about indicting our parents yeah. or yeah, blaming yeah, yeah. anybody. It's just saying, these are the things that happen. So what happens in little Mike's world is that all of a sudden I don't feel safe. I have yeah. one adult hurting me two adults who are not communicating their protection yeah. over me. Yep. Saying it, Mike, you never have to go back to that house again. You never will take care of this. That that messaging never happens. So I took responsibility for for my own safety. Yeah. So now, how does that impact me? Well, I have the primal question of am I safe imprinted on my life? I now I'm an adult. When my primal question is answered with a yes, I feel good. I'm my best self. I'm yep. a good husband. I'm a yep. good friend. Yep. I'm a good counselor. But when my primal question is answered with a no or a maybe, I don't know. Let's give you an example. A pandemic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, feeling threatened by something, not being able to control uh, outcomes. I start going in my scramble. My scramble looks like hypervigilance. Mm. Um, it looks like trying to figure out every single detail about something. So I understand it because I believe if I can understand something that I can be safe. Yeah. And I can protect myself. Yeah. And um, I get get very um, anxious, uh, very sort of, I, I get uh, kind of over indexing on work because yeah. I believe like part of my safety is the ability to have money and resource. And um, my whole life just becomes about getting a yes. Okay. Getting back into safety. Mm. And understanding that part of me is really important because basically safety is my trigger. Mm -hmm. Safety is the thing that undermines healthy relationships for me. The lack of safety causes me to lean into coping mechanisms. I don't want to have. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And so what I write about in the book is there's nothing wrong with having a primal question. It's just saying, Hey, my highest emotional need is safety. Yeah. I don't need to be ashamed of that. I don't need to be embarrassed yeah, of that. It's just but what is. It, it is what it is. The problem is the scramble. Mm. And so until I understand that I'm swimming in the water of safety, okay? Yeah. And and that water is so important to who I am yeah. and how I do everything. Yeah. If I'm not seeing that, that means I'm going to spend a lot of time in this place of coping mechanisms mm. and unhealthy behaviors and unhealthy choices instead of saying, okay, I know what's going on. I discovered my internal programming The yeah. I, I understand why this is happening and what I need. And it puts me much more in a place of self-leadership. And so kind of if I was writing prescription for my primal question or your primal question, it's taking our question and turning it into a statement. It's what I call the primal truth. And so instead of me asking, am I safe? I now live in this place where I am safe mm. and I show mm. up to, podcast interviews, knowing that I can protect myself. I am safe in Tim's presence. He's not mm -hmm. going to try to attack me or uh, hurt me or um, take control over me. All those things that as that wounded child in me that yeah. has to be uh, coached and managed and, and healed feels all those things. I can come as sort of my healthy adult self and say, I am safe. Yeah. Living in my primal truth. So, Go ahead. Yeah. Just for fun. What happens if you're actually not safe? Like what if, if it's a place you don't know me, I'm some rando guy that comes in and I start attacking something when you're coming in saying I'm, I'm safe in this. Mm -hmm. What if you're not safe? How does that work? Yeah. I think for me and, and for anybody who's listening so much of this question, the, the research shows that there typically tends to be some traumatic event mm -hmm. that imprints this question. And one of the things is that sometimes trauma creates a lot of confusion and a lot of the confusion is around our own empowerment to um, have a voice, have a say, move away. Huh. Because in many ways, when the trauma was happening to us, we had no choice. Right. We felt right. powerless. Right. I certainly did you know, when I was a kid in those moments. But I have to remind myself in part of my own practice of knowing that I don't live in a completely safe world. 
Okay. Right. And there, right. there are people that may or may not want to hurt me, but that is a reality. I do have to remind myself that I have the ability, I have the resource now mm. as an adult to deal with things that are unsafe. Mm. Whereas the wounded child in me right. didn't, didn't yeah. or doesn't feel like he has any power to do anything about yeah. it. Yep. Yep. And so again, that's, that's us operating this much more healthy, empowered place as adults and seeing ourselves as adults. One of the things that I talk about is one of my practices for safety is reminding myself that I'm now six, four. Okay. <laughs> Cause I, and it's kind of weird, but I do see myself as this weak, skinny little kid. Uh. When I, when I start trying to deal with my adult world. Okay. And I, my best reminder is hey, Mike, you're a man now. Yeah. And it feels kind of simplistic and base. Yeah. Right. And, but, but I have to remind myself that I am not this wounded, weak, powerless kid anymore, yep. that I can take on the responsibility of my own safety and not ask the question anymore. Yep. I don't have to look to any external forces to answer yes for me. I'm going to answer it for myself. Yep. And that's what it means to live in our primal truth. I Am I safe? The primal question becomes, I am safe. Mm-hmm. Okay, just can you run through the next six? Yes. Question two, am I secure? This has to do with really financial security. Do I have enough resource to protect myself? Now, there's a difference between Q1, am I safe, and am I secure? Mostly, it's about a kid or a person who grows up in a family where there just wasn't enough. You know, Mm. the bill collector is knocking on the door. Yep. Uh, Christmas is going to be a little smaller this year because dad's not making enough money. Yep. Just this kind of swimming in the water of financial insecurity as a child. You grow up with question two, wondering, do you have enough? Yep. Okay. And everything gets run through that filter. Mm. Okay. It's about money, saving money. Sometimes we we tend to hoard. We tend to check our bank accounts three times a day. Yeah. It's that kind of mindset. Again, we it, it nothing wrong with that that emotional need of security, yeah. but we gotta recognize that we're in the water. Yep. Uh, question three: Am I loved? This is really the need to feel seen and known and heard. This is where just kids tend to, my my wife's question is question three. And we we use this a lot in our marriage because it's to me the the number one reason why a relationship will either work or a relationship won't work is if, if I keep answering my spouse's primal question with a no or a maybe that relationship, that marriage Mm. will not work. Okay. But if I get really good and answering my spouse's primal question with a yes and affirming that as often as I can, that relationship is going to thrive. Oof. And that's true for marriage. That's true for friendship. That's, yeah, yeah. that's true for work, work relationships, relationships. Yep. All of it. And so that's why this is such a big idea because if we could just get to that simple concept and identify that apex emotional need of that person, we can then powerfully relate with them. But if we're unaware of that, or we're accidentally or unintentionally answering that person's primal question with a no or a maybe it, that relationship's going to break down rather. Yeah. Ooh. So hers is am I loved. And so we work really hard on, on talking about that in our marriage of how can I answer that with a yes. Mm -hmm. Question four, am I wanted? This is about belonging, being pursued, being connected, Every primal question comes with what I call kryptonite. And I write about this in the book. Mm-hmm. Like there's one thing that will instantly send you into your scramble for this question. It's about rejection. Anytime you feel rejected or left out, you then go to all your unhealthy coping mechanisms mm. to try to. Oh gosh. Feel okay. Again. So this is mine and we're going to dig into this <laughs> okay, in a second. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just, as you said that, I just saw some of the ways I do that. Okay. Now keep going. Okay. Uh, question five. Am I successful? This, this primal question tends to get um, imprinted when you grow up in a competitive family. It could be sibling rivalry or mom and dad put a lot of importance on the, the scoreboard. Yeah. Whether it's the grades scoreboard yeah. or yeah, the yeah, sports yeah. scoreboard. It's, I, I had one client where he talked about when he won his baseball game. Dad was really chatty on the way home. He's really uh, connecting with him and everything seemed to be good. But when they lost, dad was quiet on the ride home and he just felt like his whole 
his water was around success, right? Yeah. When he was successful, he got attention, he got loved, he got praised. Um, but when he didn't, it was a problem. And so these these folks grow up and and basically when they get a yes, success, winning, you know, they tend to be great coaches, by the way. They know how to be successful, they're great business people. Yep. They think about all the strategies. But when when failure, failure is their kryptonite, that's what's going to shake their snow snow globe yep, and yep. instantly send them into their scramble and all these unhealthy coping mechanisms when they feel like they're not winning or being successful. Yep. Question six, am I good enough? Yep. This is, uh, I always say like question six are people who are um, like child stars because they grew up constantly being judged or criticized. Okay. It's if you're on, I don't know, with some of the Disney shows, you know, those kids like Britney Spears, I'm sure has a, am I good enough question? Because yeah. you grew up in water. The water is constant criticism, critiquing, judging. Mm. And it, then mm. you are imprinted with this existential question. Like, am I even good enough to be here? Or yeah. am I always flawed? Yeah. Am I always less than. Uh, and then the coping mechanisms of that scramble tend to be perfectionism, overachieving, all of these things that people will do to try to prove their worth. Yeah. Um, and then question seven is, do I have purpose? And the research on this one's really interesting because people who tend to grow up in Christian homes or faith-based homes tend to have this primal question of purpose because the conversations at the dinner table were God's got a great purpose for your life. Yep, yep, you know, right, you're going to have right, a great impact. Right. And right. you hear that as a kid and it, perhaps that concept isn't fully built out for you. You just think like, well, I'm supposed to go to Africa and save Africa. Yeah. And now you're an adult and you're not saving Africa. Yep. You, you got a middle management job at yep. Chrysler. Yep. And all of a sudden you feel like your life doesn't have purpose. It doesn't have impact. And so you live with a lot of what I just call like calling angst. Okay. Am I doing the right things with my yes. life? Yes. Am I, am I where God wants me to be? Yeah. And again, it's not always trauma related in terms of the imprints of these questions. It's oftentimes just confusion. You just mm. weren't sure. And it's a kid mm. trying to figure out something as a kid coming to a particular conclusion that wasn't correct. For example, like my, my wife's, am I loved? Her parents loved her. Okay. But there was something in the water in her family, the way her mom perhaps talked over her too much at dinner table or wasn't yeah, interested yeah. enough in her crafts at, that she did at school that she just kind of felt invisible, right? She didn't feel loved or her, you know, she didn't feel known. Okay. And so the kid believes, oh, I'm not loved. It wonders if I'm loved, even though the parents are saying you are loved. And so it's a great way for us just again understand our core drivers understand yeah. what's going on here and to number one have a lot of compassion for ourselves yep but also empower us to do something with it and to live differently okay take a moment and reflect on someone whether it's your kid, it's a parent, or your closest friend, what question do you see them asking? Just choose one person right now. What question do you see them asking? And how are you answering that question? What if when our kids befriend the least popular kid in their class, it's saying something? Is it saying something about what they need answered every day? What if what upsets your spouse is so much more than needing more done around the house or with the kids? What if it's needing to know they're safe? How many times have we hurt someone and assumed an apology was enough? And what they really needed to hear is, yes, you are safe in this friendship. I want to be more aware to affirm that. So what are some of the primal questions that are around you? And what's it look like for you to engage in those questions that they already have and address them in some way? So as a dad, you've got older kids, mm -hmm. you have kids in your 20s. Yep. 
as you look back, because when you're saying each of these things, I'm thinking, gosh, I'm thinking about my kids. Yeah. You know, all four of my kids going, okay, which ones would they be scarred with? And which is just going to happen. Like, And maybe the different word is not scarred, but imprinted because impr- yeah, it's great. there's an assumption that this is a negative thing that's happening to our kids. It's a natural thing that happens. It's a natural thing that everybody's going to have. Kids are trying to figure out the world. They're trying uh-huh. to understand the world. Parents are doing the best they can for the most part yep. to try to help explain what love and success yep. Yep. and purpose and okay. belonging is. And there's just something that's perhaps getting lost. Now, there is certainly trauma that plays a big role totally. in this. But here's the other thing to think about as a parent. Most of us will parent to our primal question. The research shows this. We take our primal question and we put it over everybody else that we meet, including our kids. Now, our kids may have a different primal question. Right. But Tim, let's say your primal question is, am I wanted? Uh You will take the am I wanted question and you will put it over your four kids. And then you as a father will do everything in your power to answer that primal question with a yes. Mm. Okay. Now for me, I rate, I parented my kids through the, the primal question of, am I safe? Cause I put my question. Yeah, am I for safe? sure. For and I sure. wanted to make sure I did everything I could to make sure my kids felt safe. Yep. Okay. And so what, what I always tell parents is be aware of that proclivity to over index on your own primal question yes. in your parenting. Yes. And what I say is good parenting answers all seven questions for yeah. your kids is talking about and interacting with your kids with all seven. I love that. Well, my question was, how do you mitigate these things in your kids? And mm-hmm. that would be your answer. Yeah. So the answer is be aware of your tendency uh-huh. to put your question on your child Yep. and think that's what they're asking. That's their highest emotional need is the, feel connected and belonging and wanted, yeah, okay? Yeah. Or me for safety. And pay attention and listen to what your kids are saying to you. I was um, I was uh, in a small group. I was working with some couples uh, this week. And one of them was mentioning their kid, let's say he was six, seven years old. Whenever something was going wrong or they felt like they were in trouble, the the child would say, I love you. 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 Okay. Now what I would say to a parent is, okay, listen to what your kids are saying in moments like that, because perhaps love is the kind of core emotional need that the language that your child is using, the things that they care, are they really interested in winning? Mm. Do they feel, are they really deflated when they lose? Yep. Um, Okay. That might be a, am I successful question? Yeah. Or, if they're really scared or anxious or unsure about going over to somebody's house, perhaps that's a, am I safe question? So parents leaning in to say, what is the highest emotional need and how can I, as a parent speak to that and affirm that yeah. and remind them that, that it's a yes. That's really interesting. So it, it would almost just be like my wife and I taking a second and thinking through, okay, what, what is this one kid? What is Aaron? Mm-hmm what are the things that we're hearing themes that we're hearing in his sadness or complaints of things or angst? Yes. Or the thing I would say, there's kind of three areas we look at. We look at anything that what his triggers are. Yeah. Uh, What triggers are what we love that. Okay. Okay. Um, Also, I'd be looking at what is the things that they care about the most in Uh, terms of that, what they're drawn to the, the, like, like the deeper things, the thing under the thing. Or the specific things like gaming, well, or is it the things underneath the things? Here's what I say is I, I'd be looking at the things in relationship. So for example, what's one of your kids' names? Uh, Aaron. Aaron. Okay. So let, let's say you're, you're watching it, watching Aaron and Aaron's really interested in the kid in the classroom who's the outsider. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Who's left out. Yep. Okay. He's drawn to that kind of kid. Versus, I don't know, the the successful jock or the kid who's who's the A plus star. Yep, right. So I'd, I'd say, okay, he really has an affinity. Aaron has an affinity towards the outsider. Well, that might have to do with his need to feel wanted and belong. Again, him taking, I'm giving him yeah. Aaron the same question no, as you. This is Malia. I mean, that would be my, my daughter, Malia. That Malia, would be hers. Okay. Yeah. So Malia 
perhaps has the primal question of, am I wanted? Mm. She puts that primal question over her classmates and she looks for the classmates that are most unwanted. Uh. Now, this is the, the beautiful part about what I, I think God does with our wounds from our childhood and things that, that feel like brokenness. With every primal question comes a primal gift. Okay? Uh. And the gift is the relational superpower that you have because of the question. So I'll give you an example. My primal gift is helping people feel safe. Feel safe, yeah. Okay? Which then I can deploy out into the world. I can deploy it into my counseling practice, deploy it with uh-huh. friends. It's why people for my entire life have opened up to me and told me yep. their yep. all their details of their life after knowing me for five minutes because yep. I'm doing something that says yes to your safe. Yep. And so, um, because I've been studying safety my entire life. Yeah. I have a PhD in safety. You have a PhD in belonging. Yeah. Okay? Yep. So Tim, take your, your primal gift. You have an incredible gift and skill to help, to help people feel included, mm-hmm. wanted, mm. a part of. Okay. That is something that you need to find ways to deploy that out into the world and in all different ways, like with your family, your uh, friends, your band, yeah. um, people that you 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 create music for, like in, you just create this this place of inclusion, right? Mm. Togetherness. Mm-hmm. That's a primal gift that you have because of your primal question. You don't have the gift of safety. Okay, yeah. I do. Yeah, I'm not saying you don't. Yeah, you, thanks. You, you have yeah. the ability wow. to make people feel safe, but this is a superpower, right? And that's why I would say it's like when we think about parenting, we don't want to try to stop primal questions. What we want to do is we want mm. to recognize primal questions so then we can affirm with yeses to our children, but also know that they are now hardwired for this incredible gift that they can bring into the world. Like your daughter has the ability to see the outsider unlike anybody else yeah. does. Yeah. And how is she going to use that gift to help? Uh, her ki- other kids in her classroom, but also as she grows up yep. into this amazing woman to help just all the lonely people of the yeah. world feel like they have a place. I love that. Okay, so that's episode one of two episodes that we're doing with Mike Foster on this. Next one, I'll be going through my primal questions. Oh, you guys, it's really helpful. I've gone through this a few times now with my wife and it's been really helpful. Even doing this with somebody else, I'd encourage you to have this conversation with somebody else. So get ready for the next one coming out. But before we do that, a few thoughts I had. Uh, one was we might be answering someone else's question, unintentionally even, with a yes or a no with our responses. And I was thinking as a parent, as a friend, this is just another way for me to be curious about people around me and what, what are they actually asking? Because I know what they're saying. But what's the primal need, the primal question that they actually have and the way that I'm answering and the yes or no uh, might be helping or hurting them? And can we be more curious about what someone is asking when they are upset, rejected, angry, when they're isolating? Anyways, I'm excited to hear stories from you. So this week's practice, uh, because that's kind of the point of 10,000 Minutes, is putting things into practice, not just hearing it and going, wow, great concept. But what does it look like for us to put these things into practice with Jesus? Not for him, but with him. Like we get to be with God. He gets to form us for the sake of the whole community. So our practice is discover your primal question. That you would just discover it and you just be aware of it as you go through your week. Be curious about your childhood. What emotional need did you feel like your parents did or didn't answer? Again, doesn't make anybody bad. This is just how it went and how we read things, right? Tune into your emotional needs this week and tune into other people's emotional needs this week. And please go check out Mike Foster's free primal question assessment. And that can be found at primalquestion.com. Once again, primalquestion.com. And then would you join our Facebook group where we will be sharing our results and talking through this as a community? So that would be helpful. Please subscribe to our podcast, sign up for our free weekly encouraging text messages. You put into your phone 59925 and then the message just says 10K, 10K to 59925. 
and uh, we'll send you some text messages or uh, send us an email at mail at 10,000 minutes.com mail at one zero 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 minutes.com guys thanks for listening get ready for next week be aware of your primal question this week okay love you guys thank you <laughs>